You will, of course, have heard of people power before, but perhaps not like this. Can we harness the energy of all of us to generate electricity for a carbon-free world? Welcome to Roundtable. Hello from me, David Foster. If we can ever have a world without fossil fuels, well, we need alternative energy sources. So, on Roundtable, we've been looking at where our power might come from in the future. The latest in our series, using people to generate electricity. We've become used to machines and motors doing most things for us. But of course, it wasn't always this way. Our ancestors could only rely on themselves for power. And for one of the energy sources of tomorrow, we could be going back to the future, human power. Physically active human beings can generate up to 500 watts of body heat and at least as much power as one meter squared solar PV panel on a sunny day and as much as 10 meters squared of solar PV panels on an overcast day. During shorter efforts, the mechanical power output of a human being can increase substantially, up to 150 watts while operating a hand crank, and up to 500 watts on a bicycle over a period of one minute. And as the population grows and traditional forms of energy rapidly deplete, the human potential increases. So are we ready to harvest human power? And we have plenty of energy at the round table today. Daniel Shin joins us, lecturer at Nottingham Trent University. Mark Jones here too from Sports Art, a company working on getting energy from fitness facilities. Neil White is here too, professor at the University of Southampton and from the United States. Kerry Pint, a mechanical engineer from Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. There's so much to discuss here. But let me come to you first of all, Kerry. Your idea is to get us all wearing clothes exosuits, if you like, and in our daily lives, we would generate the power. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, exosuits are what we can make today with stuff we put on the table and, and we, we, we build. But I think that the really exciting thing going forward is to design textiles and fabrics that can actually very efficiently convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. So that's, that's what we're focused on doing. And, in my research team. Well, give us an idea how that might work. That I, I would pull on a sweater or a jumper or a pair of shoes, and how would I generate electricity or power? Yeah, absolutely. So, so essentially, the fabrics that are stitched into this this suit, or you know, shirt or, or pants or whatever you wear, um, every time that you bend these, they they create a little electrical pulse. And if if we can efficiently convert that bend into an electrical pulse. Um, without losing too much energy the way that current energy harvesting options do today, um, then this can actually be a viable source to power your smartwatch or you know even transmit that power locally to another storage source. So that's that's kind of the the thing that we're focused on. So, so we could, Neil, I saw I saw you um, nodding your head in agreement to some of what he was saying. Could we, in effect, with six seven billion people on Earth, use the clothes that we wear? to keep us going with electricity. Yes, I think this is, this is a, a thing that some people refer to as parasitic harvesting, whereby you have a small device located on your clothing or within your clothing. And as humans, we're generating energy continuously as we go about our everyday life, walking down the street, walking upstairs. Obviously, our bodies give off heat, so generating electrical power from, from heat is a possibility. And, and you can use that to generate small quantities that, as Carey says, could be used to power electronic devices. It's probably not going to be the sort of um, power that can actually be put back into the grid, but nevertheless, it can be used to power devices. But that is at the moment. I, I'm, That's I'm, at the I'm, moment. I'm assuming Kerry yeah. was suggesting that it could perhaps be stored somewhere, and if it's stored somewhere, I'm guessing it, it could, at some point, if there was enough of it, Go Absolutely, to, go yeah. to the group. I mean, it, it, You've got to make sure that everybody has these clothes, so that's a difficulty. Yes, I, th I think you're right. I think there's a, there's a social argument about whether or not we actually want human beings to work harder to generate the power that we, that we consume every day. 
And um, I, I think the point about parasitic harvesting is that provided that it's lightweight and you don't know that it's happening, then there's no reason why everybody would not want to use it. Well, that. this is something that you've been doing anyway, Mark, with your company. Yes. That you have been getting the beings who go to the gyms, or in one case you installed it in a, an office, didn't you, in, in Indeed, a bank, yeah. to produce power. How much did they, could they, could they generate? Well, our equipment actually harvests 74% of the user's energy and converts it back to electricity. Which, in real terms, is what? If somebody cycled for... For example, if somebody's low-level exercise, they're putting out about 100 watts per hour. So if we think about a laptop, to charge a laptop over an hour is 60 watts. So if we then take that to an educational base where you've got children doing PE, they can then get their head around, OK, what does energy actually cost and what do I need to do to power my iPad, laptop, etc. So they would start to think about it in, in real terms, that they could produce this energy. Absolutely, yes. Uh, at the moment, in, in these gyms, is it just theoretical or are they actually sort of seeing the light bulb as they slow uh, down, get a bit dimmer? And <laughs> Not it's... quite there yet, no, no. But what they're actually seeing is lower energy costs. And when we're looking at local authorities, they're actually, because of their corporate social responsibilities and the climate emergencies, they can actually see that they're making a difference on two points. They're, they're buying equipment that obviously fits the bill for the exerciser, but more importantly, they're reducing the carbon. But, uh, but they're quite expensive, aren't they, at the moment? Same price as any other uh, equipment oh, that's on the fair, market. Okay, yes, no more expensive. Suggesting that it, it, it wasn't quite cost effective, that your return on investment wasn't... But you're working on that. It's changing every day, isn't it? It's about choice. I mean, we, we choose the vehicle we drive, so we can choose to, to drive an electric vehicle now. So if you look at gym owners or even, you know, facilities in residential areas, mm. they can choose to buy equipment which is more eco-friendly. So there's Mark, Daniel, suggesting it's about educating people that this is possible and that it could be used in, in, in all manner of different things. It's about convincing people, isn't it? And that's not easy at the moment. Yes, right now, um, if you actually calculate the electricity that this generates and to perceive that as an energy saving, uh, it's really tiny. So, for example, if you power the TV um, for a week, that's about 10 pence of uh, money that you're actually saving. And if you, you know, multiply that by 52 weeks in a year, it's about, you know, really tiny amount of money that you're actually generating. So if you ask a question, why would you use human power as an alternative to grid power, the actual cost saving is very little. So we have to look at the other side. If people are spending 50 pounds or 350 pounds a year, go to a gym, um, but you can actually burn the same calorie at home by turning the, you know, installing some uh, exercise bike at home to generate electricity. The actual uh, benefit that people is going to get is not just about energy saving, but being healthier. What about the scale of it all, though? Because this is what fascinates me. Yes, I mean, you, you can get a wind-up radio. They, they became quite famous yeah. in parts of Africa. I saw something uh, for winding up and charging um, an iPhone the other day. It, it actually folded in 2013. It didn't become that viable. I don't, I, I don't know why. But what about, and we've discussed on this programme before, anybody can j jump in on this. So, so let me just throw this one at you, Kerry, first of all. What about um, smart cities, where you have moving pavements that generate electricity, where, where you have heat suction devices on the corners of street that could actually take our own human body energy, the warmth that we create, and power entire cities this way? You know, I, I think it's feasible if you look at the technology that's out there. I think that the, the challenge is how do you calculate the, the cost benefit that you get from that infrastructure versus the cost input that you have to put in to make it? And, and that's where efficiency is so important because the energy that you generate is a commodity and you can value that. And, and so when, when you design a new piece of infrastructure, if it produces energy or harvests energy from its surroundings, you have to be able to justify that the extra added cost for this extra functionality is, is valued based on the, you know, extra energy output that you get. Now, right now, that energy, as, as folks are saying here, is too small to be really meaningful. You know, you can't think about a billion dollar do-over for a city if you're going to be producing, you know, a, a, you know, a few hundred bucks of, of <laughs> power per, per day. You know, that, that doesn't make sense. And that's kind of where we're at economically. Yes. So not at the moment. Daniel, you, you quite like the idea of smart cities, I think, don't you? 
Well, I think just to uh, carry on from uh, Carrie's point, the, it's very important to communicate what is the actual true benefit of using kinetic energy. But we've been somehow, you know, historically we have used human power for a very long time. We have a hand whisk, uh, we push the door knob. We, we still heavily rely on human power, but we've been indoctrinated to believe that this has been gradually been replaced by electrical motors. And now people are perceiving human power to replace the batteries or some kind of electricity. Um, but but it's, it's very important to communicate the benefit, which is, again, going back to health benefits. Uh, you know, UK government spending 1.6 billion pounds to tackle the uh, physical inactivity related disease. But if we can make people to be aware that contributing your kinetic power, human power to not only generate electricity, but to bring the society to be more healthier, that is the benefit that we should communicate to people. So it's a win-win. Yes, a win-win system. So I, I use the term double dividend, where not only communicating to people about the cost benefit, but also there's many other potential benefits that people will get by using kinetic power. I'll start with you on this one, Mark, but I, I, it could be anybody. Um, you're all experts in this field. Could you ever see a time when we became net producers of electricity rather than net users? In other words, we made more than we actually used? I'd like to think we could. And I think, as you said earlier about education of children actually being aware of it, I think generations going forward maybe look down that avenue. Certainly, if you're, if you're going to be exercising, you're going to be putting something in, and the piece of equipment you've got is drawing power, well, we've got now got devices that don't draw any power but create something, albeit not a great amount at the moment to reduce cost by that much, but actually the technology is there. What about this idea of stealing my energy? In other words, you've got a device on the corner of the street <laughs> that as I walk past, instead of being nice and cosy and toasty on a sort of winter's day, I suddenly start to shiver because it's been stolen and taken and put into the <laughs> electrical grid. I mean, is, is that bonkers for me to think that? Well, I, I think it's a, a scenario that, again, would be you could look at from both sides. I think the, you know, this argument about, as you say, are we actually doing this technology to, 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 to produce more energy than we're consuming? The other way of looking at it is saying, is it possible for us simply to reduce the amount of power that we consume, given that there are finite resources available to produce that power? I think but that... this isn't, isn't this what we're talking about? There are not finite resources to produce this power if we are the resources. But it's, it's, it's then a social argument, isn't it? You, is, as, as Daniel said, years ago, humans did everything. There was no electricity. Everything, we relied on humans for, for, for surviving. Um, are we prepared to go back, roll the clock back three to 400 years? I think it's a fundamental question. OK, what about stealing my energy? Uh, could somebody, with my permission, just take my energy as I walked past, as long as I'd signed the consent form, like sort of donating your organs after you're dead. <laughs> I, I know that, let's say, I, I'm walking through Piccadilly Circus, I'm going to contribute to the uh, national grid by walking past that lamppost that's got sensors on it. Is it possible that that could be part of the future? Oh, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the fun thing about thinking about that scenario is that taking that energy also gives data about you Right. And, and so you, you can you can crunch all this data on a computer and then look at trends in human beings and so on as you sort of take their their energy. The, the, the thing to think about, though, is that this energy isn't coming from us. Right. This energy is coming from food. Right. And so if everyone if, if it's not a passive source of harvesting energy, and it's an active source of harvesting energy. Now you're just offsetting that challenge into the agricultural space, right? You're not really, you know, sort of getting energy from this free pot in the universe that we live in. OK, so we could then transpose it to, to cows. We could transpose it to any kind of animal that we, we exploit, it, even wild animals as, as well. But we have to store it. And it was interesting, Kerry, that you talked about us um, in the sense of we are batteries for energy. We, we just store the energy and then we use it. And so much of this debate in the past has been about the fact that we cannot store it. Batteries, though, are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. We're going to be able to do... Who wants to pick up on that one in, in terms of what can be done and what could be stored? Well, I think the... Um, the although batteries are getting smaller, I think the, ener the big challenge is to improve the energy density within the battery so you can get a lot more total energy in a smaller area. I think that's one aspect of technology that perhaps hasn't advanced um, over the last 20 years or so.
but in sense of the electronic components that go with it, the power consumption of modern day phones, whatever you want to look at, sensors, has got a lot smaller. So we're doing a lot more with the available um, batteries that we have. And the other thing about energy harvesting is what we're uh, using that for is to potentially replace batteries. So, of course, you've got the issue of things like disposal. Um, sometimes they contain toxic materials. So either extending the life of the battery or ultimately eliminating the need for the battery. So, so in a sense, you're talking about, in the, in the modern vernacular, streaming energy, that you wouldn't ever need to put it somewhere to use it later. It would be continually available. It would be continually available, yeah. That's in other words, you could just scenario. turn it on whenever yeah. you wanted it. And yeah. What, what are the advantages that you've seen in, in your business? I mean, you, I don't know how you got into this in the first place, but it's... Well, I've been in health and fitness for 20 years, so one of the things that I think joining this company and joining, understanding the technology is, I think of those 20 years and all the gyms that I've visited or seen across the UK and Europe, what if we'd harnessed all that power? And what if it was sitting somewhere now? What would that equate to? And what do you think? Massive, absolutely massive. And people are choosing to go to gyms. People are choosing to exercise. As Daniel said, there's a health benefit to it, but what if they can actually see what they're generating in what? So we know that there are conferences on climate change. Do you think we are going to have a conversation at some point about making it pretty much compulsory, not for people to go to the gym, but for if they go to the gym, to, to know that this is being used and put back into some kind of, uh, if you like, community use? Yeah, I think it's really important to, for, for people in the research field to figure out a way to measure all these kinds of benefits that we just discussed, that is health, that is energy. Uh, but I think the, the really the important function about human power product or using human power as a renewable energy is a feedback. So like you said about the scenario of stealing people's energy, we can install a dynamo in any revolving door in any building to generate electricity. But if we can communicate to people where this electricity is being used or how this is being contributed to building uh, energy or in something else, that's how, that's when, the moment when people think that they're okay to contribute. Because until now it has been about short-termism, doesn't it? I mean, fossil fuels have been easy to get, uh, there's been no obvious alternative to it. Now, now we know we have to change our minds, then something like a, a dynamo in, in every single... Uh, it, it, you, you talked about a revolving door or, or wave power as well, because yes. as the waves are always coming in and they're always going out. So th this is the conversation we have to have now. I'm not so sure, Kerry, I like your suggestion and the big smile when you said that not only could they nick my energy, but they could also find out all sorts of things about my data. This is yeah. Big Brother world, isn't it? Well, you know, at, at some point, and, and this is why it's so fun to be an energy guy. So I, I, my focus is on batteries, it's on energy harvesters, and it's on converting CO2 into useful stuff. And it all builds into the same thing, that at some point it's an energy problem. And, and when, when you really dig deep into that problem, there's this intersection between energy and data that you get from getting energy back from motion and activity in, in the universe or in the world that we live in, right? Um, and, and that's something that we're going to have to think about how to manage as we go further into this technology space. And you started off by telling us about the particular textiles you were developing. Uh, do you want to go into any more detail on that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, what, what we've done is we've simply redesigned a battery. And, and so a battery is really energy efficient. Um, but traditionally in battery technology, as you've heard so far, the focus is getting to really like high performance batteries, you know, getting batteries that can store, you know, high voltage, high capacity, you know, and you benchmark the, the value of that battery based on the cost per kilowatt hour of, of storage. And, and right now the challenge with batteries is that number is way too high. But what, what we can do is we can, we can take biocompatible materials, biocompatible polymers, you know, polyester, you know, essentially build this, this thing into a, you know, very low voltage battery-like harvester that retains some of the energy efficiency that batteries have. And, and it, now it's 30 to 50 times more efficient than, you know, piezoelectrics or triboelectrics, which are these, these platforms for energy harvesting that have have been researched a lot, but they haven't met a lot of applications um, because they're 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 relatively inefficient, especially in the frequency range, the very low frequencies of human motion. I mean, hu humans are are very slow animals if you think about that. I mean, Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world, you know, he's a five hertz machine, 
right? And and so we 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 have these these harvesters that can harvest mechanical motions, you know, 50 hertz, 100 hertz, very you know, one percent or so efficient. When you drop down to these low frequencies, now this becomes a challenge, and the efficiencies of those systems drop to dismal levels. And so that's what we're trying to overcome. Wow. I, I, I threw out the question before we went on air. I said I'd mention it later on in the program. Um, could we save the world and sort out its energy problems this way? Not just human movement, but also animal movement, if you like, biological movement. You're into sort of gyms and health and everything like that, but you probably have a thought on it as well. What do you well, think? Yes, I think if we can make a difference now, and as technology progresses, we make a bigger difference. I think that matters. I mean, what, what's, what's key to me is, is how we motivate people to do a bit more as well. If they thought they could actually make a difference, would that be a conscious effort from them? To and is it as simple as saying, look, you know, you can take this home and you can see a difference. You, you children yeah. can do that. You've got to educate people like, like that or other, other ways of doing it. One of the things that we're, we're using is we have screens in the gyms which show you who are the top energy creators, not energy users. So what we used to do in health and fitness was show people how many calories they burned or how much energy they'd, they'd consumed elsewhere. And it's energy balance. The more you burn off, the less you eat, energy balance. But one of the things that's interesting for us now is when people see how many watts they're generating on a scoreboard, they want to be the top because we're all competitive animals, especially people who go to the gym. Daniel, motivator. What, what's the most exciting thing going on like this at the moment? Could we save the world? Yes, I think um, I feel kind of responsible as a researcher looking at this field to amplify what's the benefit of a human power. One of the studies I'm doing is to um, install a human power products to home environment to have uh, children generate electricity to power their TV. Uh, but the, the, the consequences it's generating is that you know, kids usually leave their TV on. Uh, mm -hmm. when they're not watching, even they're not watching. But once we install these kind of devices, they become so aware about their electricity consumptions, so, so they change their behaviour. Paint a picture for me. You, you, ha you haven't got little Johnny sitting on a bicycle and the only way his TV is going to work is if he pedals hard. Well, there's a little interface devices in between, so as the more you generate the power, it will, it will, it will generate a credit. And when you plug your TV onto these devices to start consuming the electricity, the credit goes down. Um, so he would know, he or she would know, that if they stopped pedaling, they wouldn't have enough to keep it going later. Therefore, they would be yes, doing it, two things. One is not using electricity generated by other means. Yeah. And, and secondly, getting a lesson, yes. learning something. If they reach the credit zero, it will basically shut off the TV. Um, but you have that white dot that we used to have many, <laughs> yeah. many years ago when you turned your television off. Um, now, what, what do you think the next step is going to be here? Well, as Kerry was saying, I think the, ne the next steps are to do with improving efficiency of the techniques. That includes um, new materials. There are, uh, uh, these techniques have been around for a long time, and I think the reason perhaps why they weren't exploited 40, 50 years ago is the advancement of, of new, new technologies, new materials, um, particularly the thermoelectrics, the triboelectric materials that um, Kerry mentioned, which is, again, it's a very, very old method. It involves rubbing... Um, conductors against insulators. Is it to static? So it's static? It's kind of electrostatic method, yeah. yeah. So it's, um, you know, improving the efficiency of that and then ultimately finding a, a really uh, good way of storing that, that energy. That really is the key to all this. So I could the solve the world's storage. energy problems by having one of those awful jumpers that makes exactly. your hair stand, stand on end, on end. Every, time you you take it, every time <laughs> yeah. you take it off. And if I put, pull that on and off about 100 times a day... You could save the planet, absolutely. Bingo. <laughs> Kerry, when you go and talk to your students next about this, what, what are you going to say? Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, my, my take on this is... I, I, I love this idea of finding places that we waste energy and try to bring current solutions to those places to get some of that back. I think that's fantastic and that's, that's, that's putting a brick in the wall. It's not going to change the world overnight, but you're building that wall of change that you need to consistently construct over time to make this type of thing happen. You can't, um, you can't do one without the other, in other words. Yeah, right. But the, the other thing we have to think about in this is that when we go and, and remanufacture new products or, or even have people convert passive motions into active efforts. So say you, you, you have the whole population of the world go and spend 30 extra minutes you know, on an exercise bike instead of taking those people who passively do it already. Now what you're doing is you're one, you're, you're manufacturing systems a little differently so that they can harvest energy. And I think that 
using conventional technology, the cost of that is, is a little low, but still there's energy required. And then on top of that, you also have to think about the agricultural side of this, right? I mean, where do we get that energy that we burn from? It's food, right? And, and so, you know, I, I think in the, in the energy picture, what we have to always think about is we have to think about the whole picture. We can't think about just one component. Um, and we, we have to make sure that if we design technology that it's actually going to be, you know, energy efficient when we consider the whole system. <laughs> I, I, I listen, I thank you very much indeed. I have this extraordinary picture of one day perhaps not needing to eat because I can go to a, a, some kind of source and just get the energy put back <laughs> into me, energy which somebody's stolen earlier in the week or, or perhaps <laughs> borrowed for better uses because there are 1,000 or 100,000 people peddling very hard some corner of the world. Yeah. It's fantastic. This is the Ideas Programme. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, go back to um, listening to some good music in Nashville. We appreciate your time out. Uh, from me, David Foster, from my guests, thank you so much for watching. It has been full of energy, as it should be, this roundtable. Goodbye for now.